This series is is probably just the most sensitive that we've done, and uh, we'll upload them to our patron page um, if you want to access them later on. But I really want to make this three part series about your story, and we're all on this journey of healing, and sometimes we don't know how to go about it. And so I really want to. I'll actually. I have some homework don't think of it as homework but even after the session where hey maybe do something this this week that can help you learn more about your own story so healing what is healing pope benedict says healing is essential is an essential dimension of the apostolic mission and of christianity when understood at a sufficiently deep level it expresses the entire content of redemption so healing, inner healing, it's not something that you can do to be happier. Benedict is saying it is redemption. It's synonymous with redemption. So Christ won. He had the redemptive act to give us complete life, to heal us fully, redeem us fully. But we live in this state where, well, why the heck am I not fully healed? Why am I so broken? Why are people born blind? Why am I, you know, why do people hurt? Why do people assault? Why do people lie? Um, Lord, where's your redemptive act? Are you even real? You know, and, and I really want this three-part series to be, to be about how do we practically enter our own healing journey? Because we were born without God's consent, but he will not redeem us without our consent. And this is a day in and day out entering into our own redemption. And it's really at the heart of it, a redemption and interior journey of our identity. So I want to paint just a short story of, of what I want out of this, the hope is out of this series. I was working at Washington State University as a campus minister for two years, and we got involved, me and the head priest, Father Paul, got involved with the college football team on campus. And some of them started coming to Mass. And the kicker, he was Catholic, but he was second string. He wasn't starting. And even when he was practicing, he was missing a ton of field goals. He didn't have confidence at all. His performance was poor. And he wasn't starting yet. And he would talk to the priest like, I don't know what it is, but I'm looking for my identity and my performance and what, you know, I'm trying to perform well so that the players and everyone else can think I'm good or that I'm enough. And Father Paul says, I want you to practice something. Whenever you kick the ball, I want you to announce out loud, I'm a beloved son of the Father. I want you to just announce that out loud, I'm a beloved son of the Father. He started doing that during practice. He was practicing this new way of thinking. I'm a beloved son of the Father as my core identity. Well, the, the uh, first string kicker gets hurt and... Well, now you're starting. Now you're, you're playing in the big games now. Good luck. And he would say in the games when he kicked the ball, I'm a beloved son of the father. And he ended up winning Pac-12 kicker of the year. And he, he said afterwards, I, pr I played freely. I played freely because my career, my, uh, my, my relationships, what people think about me, my job, the amount of money I make, my performance, isn't my core identity. My core identity is beloved son. But oftentimes we live out of other wounded places that make us look for our identity, identity in other things. And we are in need of healing. I was recently speaking at a high school, an all girls high school here in Nashville, St. Cecilia. And I was praying before and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to tell them? What do you want me to talk about to these ladies? I'm, I'm this dude going to talk to this all girls school. What am I going to do? <laughs> what am I going to say? How am I going to connect to them? And God just whispered to me, Brendan, I want you to just tell them that they are enough. That they are enough. That's what I want you to tell them. And I was like, okay, I, I don't know when I'm going to tell them that, but okay. So right in the middle of the talk, I just stopped and I said, ladies, I was praying right before this and God, had, God wanted me to tell you something. You're all enough. Your grades don't define you, your athletics, you're enough right where you are. And afterwards, 
like this group of five girls came up to me and said, Brendan, Brendan, that just pierced my heart. When you said that God told you to tell, tell us that, I was just so overwhelmed and I needed to hear that. What we're going to be kind of diving in, what I want you to kind of be diving into in your own heart is what are the lies that maybe you've believed throughout your life, throughout your life story of things that have happened to you? Because there's a lot of lies. I'm ugly. I'm stupid. No one cares for me. I'm not enough. I'm unlovable. These are lies that are false. And it, that's the evil one's tactics to ultimately destroy us. What do we see in the movie Lion King? This depicts what Satan does. Simba, he didn't do anything really that wrong, right? But Scar killed his father, but Simba thinks it's his fault. So Scar goes over to Simba and says, look what you did. Look what you did. Gosh, if your mother found out, what would she think of you? He even threw that card in there. What would your mom think of this? And Simba's freaked out. He has fear. He's like, well, what do I do, Scar? What do I do? And Scar just says, run away and never return. He whispers a lie. And one guy on this retreat, we were watching this Lion King, Lion King clip and this guy raised his hand. He's like, I get it. I finally get Satan's tactics. He doesn't just destroy us. He whispers a lie into our heart that we operate out of and we begin to destroy ourselves. It's all the heart. It's all about what is going on in my interior heart. Christ came after the heart to speak his truth and his love. And it all took place really on the Sermon on the Mount, where he addresses to all the Pharisees who are caring about actions and their behaviors and looking great on the outside, looking for approval on the outside, all about the law. And Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill. But I say to you, if you look at, or if you have anger in your heart, you've basically already killed them. You know the law, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, even if you look at a woman with lust, he said this to the men, you've already committed adultery in the heart. Jesus then says to them, cleanse the inside of the cup so that the outside might be clean. Okay, what, is he, what does he mean by this? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. How do we get a pure heart? What does that even mean? How do we clean the inside of our hearts? That's what we're going to be talking about in this series, is the practical guidance. How do we have purity of heart? Other than just, I've been praying for it every day. I've been praying for it every day. And it seems like God's not showing up and giving me that purity of heart. I have learned a whole lot from Dr. Bob Schutz with the John Paul II Healing Center. And I kind of want to reveal to you kind of his model of, of inner healing because I think it's actually brilliant and it actually works. So I want to share with you a little of my story and I'm going to get into that in the second session more. But everything that I've learned from Dr. Bob Schutz's books, I did counseling myself, is what I kind of want to share with you of things that have actually worked in my own experience. So Dr. Bob Schutz would say something like this. Oftentimes in the Catholic world, the Christian world, we are trying to figure out how to get rid of our sins. We're trying to figure out how to get rid of our sins. We go to confession. We confess all of these sins. We go out into the real world. We come back and we say the exact same stuff over and over and over and over. Or maybe you're feeling bitter. Maybe you're feeling lonely. Maybe you have an addiction or a compulsion. Maybe you're struggling and you've been struggling for so long and it's like you feel depressed, you feel just completely alone and you've prayed and prayed and prayed. It's like, how do I stop feeling this way? How do I get rid of this compulsion? And it's like, is there hope? You know, we're so focused on the sin or the behaviors when that's not the problem, Dr. Bob Schutz would say. The problem is woundedness in our heart. So he talks about a tree, all right? So he's like, look at a tree. You're like a tree. All human beings are like a tree. And in the beginning before sin, they were naked. They felt no shame. There was perfect communion, perfect harmony. They delighted in one another for their goodness, not to use or manipulate. 
Everyone was a gift. Everyone saw one another as a gift. Everyone marveled at one another, all right? Perfect communion, naked without shame. And they were secure in love. So it, like a tree, if the root system is healthy, then it's gonna produce good fruit. So in other words, if our root system is, is that we are secure and grounded in our identity, I'm beloved son, I'm beloved daughter. This is who I am deeply. Security. We will then mature well, maturity, and then flows out purity, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Kindness, gentleness, self-control, humility, right? So like a tree, if we have good roots, good security in our identity, we will have good fruit, all right? Good roots, good fruit, all right? If we have bad roots, we will have rotten fruit, aka sin, aka compulsions, bitterness, resentment, sadness, right? So we go to confession, we, we often focus on the fruit. <sighs> Look at all this bad fruit. I'm a terrible person, this, this, and this. And it's like, how do I stop this? I can't stop it. It feels like I'm out of control. Well, we have to go on the long journey of going down to the root system, which is our story, our own personal story. So I want to give you one example when I, went, when I did counseling because I was bitter and resentful and sad a lot of the time. <laughs> and day after day, I was praying and I was praying. And one day I got on my knees and I'm like, God, I don't want to follow you because I've been praying and praying and praying and you haven't answered my prayers. And I'm actually doing worse and worse. I don't want to follow you. I don't want to follow you. And I'm just being honest with God. I'm praying and I'm just getting angry and honest at God. And he's just like, okay. He's just sitting there and waiting. And then I hear Peter's words to Jesus about the Eucharist in John 6, where Jesus says, this is truly my body. This is truly my blood. And some of his disciples left him. They stopped following Jesus. He goes to Peter. Peter, are you going to leave? And Peter's like, I'm confused. I have no idea what you're talking about, Jesus. Flesh, blood, what are you talking about? He's like, but you have the words of eternal life. All right, where else am I going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And I heard that in this prayer. And it's just like, yeah, if I stopped following you, Jesus, where would I go? <laughs> I don't get you. I don't get it. And he invited me, by grace, to check out counseling. Go to counseling. And what I've learned through counseling is when you're not doing well, all right, when you're sad or angry or lonely, these feelings, these bad fruit, aren't meant to harm you. I want to say that again. These negative feelings or emotions, these sins, aren't necessarily meant to harm you. They're meant to help you. Why? Because in a sense, we're all meant to be detectives of our own self. For example, Okay, I was feeling bitter and res I was feeling lonely one day. Like, I don't belong, Lord. I don't belong. These feelings. And instead of just repressing it, like, this is a negative feeling I don't want to do and numb out on my phone or on Netflix. Instead, I'm, I'm asking, okay, where is this coming from? Why am I feeling this way? To be curious, to observe the feeling, to observe the sin. Why am I doing this? What am I really wanting? And the Lord brought me back through this prayer experience of when I was in sixth grade, all right? So this negative fruit was bitter or loneliness and not belonging. Where is this coming from? Whew, I get a flashback to sixth grade. And he brings me to being on the basketball court. I was on the basketball court and I got invited to play with the big boys, we might say, like varsity. And I was on JV and I got, finally got invited to play on varsity. And I'm like, this is my shot. This is my time to prove that I got it, that I'm a man. No joke, on the varsity team was a woman, this insanely athletic girl. And she's playing with the guys and I get a fast break. All right, I get a fast break. I'm going up for the layup. Who's behind me? The girl. And what does she do? Boom, swatted. I fall to the ground. All the guys huddle around me. Brennan got swatted by a girl. Brennan got swatted by a girl. Okay, I'm in this meditation with God. What am I feeling? I don't belong. No one sees me. Yeah, I'm feeling lonely here. Okay, the Lord's revealing to me maybe some of the roots 
And then what did I do? Lord, tell me the truth about who I am in this moment so that this can be redeemed. What does he say? You aren't who they say you are. You are who I say you are. You're beloved. You're strong, Brendan. Get up. Let's keep going. And he's speaking positivity into that memory. This is rewriting our story. You might be thinking, why am I always angry all the time? Why am I always so stubborn? Okay, what are the roots? Lord, where is this coming from? Be curious and re- begin to rewrite your story with Jesus Christ. So our sins, our feelings aren't meant to harm us. Be curious. They're meant to ultimately help us. All right? So I want to just kind of wrap this up one last time of what we kind of just went through. Why do we sin? Why do we sometimes feel bitter or resentful? First off, it stems from a wound. And in the wound, whatever that might be, lies are whispered. So wounds, the evil one creates lies about ourselves. Gosh, I have to look this way in order to be loved. No one wants me. I got to get straight A's. I got to earn a hundred grand. I got to bench 250 in order to be loved or enough. Okay. These are lies that we operate out of, out of woundedness. So wounds create lies and then lies create negative feelings and emotions attached to this. And then out of those negative feelings and emotions, we then go out and sin. We then escape in pleasure. We then grab a drink. It's because I don't want to feel this. I don't feel good. We have to go down to the root system to our story and to be patient with that process. I'll tell you this. I've been on a pretty deep healing journey the last four years. And one of the greatest advices that I've gotten is if you experience a fantasy, if you want to go sin, if you're feeling these negative emotions, observe it, observe it and don't react to it. Observe it, but don't react to it. I've had it so many times where I have an inclination to do something or to use someone or to objectify someone or to just escape. And I'm just like, mm, why is this happening? And in, in this, mm, why is this happening is my own self-reliance and pride. Instead of just like, Okay, we're not going to escape temptation in this life, but we need tools on how do we deal with it. And the big one that I've learned is observing rather than just simply reacting. And so now I want to practically give you guys an example. How do you identify your own wounds? Like, What's a tool where it's like, okay, I get it that I feel this way. I get it that I sin in this way and but I don't know where it's coming from. I really don't. How do we begin that journey? Well, like I said, be aware and observe. But this is a great exercise I heard from one of my friends who went through deep healing in his own journey um, through a certain program. It's an exercise called the amphitheater exercise. Okay? And this, I think, will help you if you practice it to discover your own story and your own woundedness. It's so powerful, okay? At least in my life, I've broken down crying like many times doing this exercise. What's the exercise? You imagine, you, you, you close your eyes and just say, I'm gonna take 15 minutes. And this again is if you're not doing well, okay? So oftentimes it's like, well, I'm doing well. Do I have woundedness? Well, if you're doing well, rejoice in that. Live in that freedom. But if you're not doing well, This could be a good exercise, the amphitheater exercise. (laughs) Close your eyes for 15 minutes and you imagine you're in an amphitheater. You could imagine you're in a stadium, whatever is comfortable for you. So you might be on stage and there is a ton of people in the audience and the lights are off. Okay, so you can't see any of these people. And you might hear a voice saying, hey, you should lust after that person. Hey, you should dominate these people, be in control. Hey, you should do this, you should do this. And you're hearing these voices telling you different things. Hey, you should eat a gallon of ice cream right now. Hey, you should binge Netflix for 10 hours. And there might be a part of you that's like, yeah, that kind of actually sounds nice. That would be nice. Be aware of the voices and ask back, where are you coming from? Who are you? 
What do you really want? Because these voices aren't you. And we tend to identify ourselves with these voices that are in our head and they are voices from a false narrative of our woundedness. Okay, so a voice might pop up, gosh, look at you, no one wants you. Instead of being like, yeah, no one wants me. Don't give that voice that power, it's not you. You and the Lord are in control. And so a voice, I, one experience happened where I heard this voice say to me, Brendan, just dominate and be and just control. Don't trust anyone. Everyone will just hurt you. Just dominate. And I'm like, dude, where are you coming from? Who are you? And it's, it's dark in this amphitheater. I'm like, who, who are you? What's going on? And he's like, yeah, don't trust women. They just reject you. Start fantasizing. I'm like, who are you? What do you want? And in this black amphitheater, I see these red eyes light up and it's, it looks like this insidious person. And I'm starting to get angry. I'm like, who are you? Identify yourself. And I walk over and I grab the guy in the middle of the amphitheater and I pick him up and the lights come on and it's 10 year old Brendan as a little boy when he was rejected. And I'm seeing this 10 year old boy crying and I'm like, oh, oh. And I have compassion on this part of my story. Oh man, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I get it. I get it. But that doesn't define you. Get up. Let's keep going. You're strong. And to speak positivity into that place with Jesus. So that's one exercise. It can, it can help you. I've done this so many times where different little Brendan's or different parts of my story have popped up and I can discover different things, but then speak truth into it. So the last thing I want to say is this, this journey, we want a pill to take and just say, okay, I'm healed. It doesn't work that way. Sadly, I wish it did. And if you ever find one, please let me know, you know, but when I've experienced the most healing, it's when I've dedicated time to my own healing. 15 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day of maybe even that exercise of allowing yourself to feel, allowing things to rise to the surface. And it's a day in and day out journey, all right, until the day we die. And I don't know the Lord's will at times with healing, why some people might be healed faster more than others, and some might be healed not until the resurrection. And a great saint kind of gives us a window into this. And maybe you've heard him. I talk about him a lot. His name is St. Mark G. Have, have, does anyone know St. Mark G? No? St. Mark G um, grew up during the Boxer Rebellion. I believe he was Chinese. And he got injured in battle, I believe it was. And he got addicted to opium, a painkiller, to so he wouldn't be in pain. And he got addicted to it. And he was this Catholic husband, family, family guy. And he, would, he kept going back to confession and said, I did it again. I got high on opium. And the priest then told him, you're not sorry for your sins. You keep doing it. Don't come back to the confessional. Don't receive the Eucharist until you're truly sorry for your sins. So for like 30 years, Mark, he went to mass every Sunday. He never received. He didn't go to confession. He prayed to God, all right, Lord. <laughs> I think the only way I can go to heaven is if I die a martyr. I pray for martyrdom, Lord. I pray for martyrdom. Well, the Boxer Rebellion happened and they were persecuting Christians and Catholics. And they grabbed Mark G and his whole entire family, like 10 of them, and basically told them, renounce Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or you'll be beheaded. And Mark told the soldiers, kill me last so that my kids don't die alone. And one after the other was beheaded and Mark G was singing a hymn to Mary and he was beheaded. And he is a canonized saint in the Catholic church, Saint Mark G. Why I share this is because you don't have to get rid of your sins in order to be a saint. All right, again, I'm not saying eliminating sin in our life is a sign or is a fruit of our holiness, 
but we shouldn't identify our holiness with the amount of sins that we have, simply. The Lord spoke to me one time in prayer, and I believe this to be true. He says, Brendan, it is better to be committing terrible sins, but knowing that you need a savior than it is to not be committing terrible sins, but don't think you need a savior. I wanna say that one more time. It's, in other words, it's better to know you need a savior. <laughs> All right, it's, it's better to know that because it gives you humility and utter reliance on God rather than pride and utter reliance on yourself. And so instead of looking at the fruit, our sins merely, St. Julian of Auric says this, God doesn't look at our sins. He looks at the pain that is in our heart. He's after the heart. He's after the heart. He's not looking at the sins. When you sin as, as, as his beloved daughter, or beloved son, he's not, look what you did again. He's looking at the heart. What do you really want? He sees the pain. And it's for us to be vulnerable and to open up those places. Lord, where is this coming from? Help guide me to see my own story so that I can rewrite my story, so that I can be healed, that I can be fully alive who I was created to be. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.